Welcome to Functional Philosophy. I'm Charles Tu. That's T as in tango, E as in echo, and W as in whiskey. This is episode number six, and its title is Taffer's Delight, a conversation with Bioshock creator Ken Levine, part two. You're about to listen to part two of my conversation with Ken Levine. I assume you've listened to part one, so no contextualizing. Just enjoy. There's a tendency for people to think of morality as synonymous with altruism. People don't really see a purpose for the category for the category of morality, because it only has one content, and that's altruism, as far as they can tell. Now, Ayn Rand herself spoke in moral, even strident terms, and yet people still write that element of hers off as non-essential or maybe some kind of rationalization because even she can't escape morality. Now, this is actually the view I got from Bioshock. Um, Near the beginning, Andrew Ryan has that line about the bonds of petty morality. So, what were your thoughts in that? Did you regard her as basically amoral, and yeah, she uses moral terms, but she's not really interested in it? Or did you regard her as having a different kind of morality? Remember that Andrew Ryan is, is, is a, not Ayn Rand, a- Andrew Ryan is somebody, I t- he's, obviously de- he's obviously deeply connected, right? Mm-hmm. But I wasn't, tr- I wasn't like going back to my copies of Rand to make sure everything <laughs> Ryan was saying was completely in line with Rand, because I was building a character. Um, I mean, you could have surprised me, because if you did this by memory or something, that's pretty good, because there's no, some... I ha- the, the most useful source was a book called Ayn Rand Speaks, and it was, um, and it's basically a bunch of interviews and stuff she did. Yeah. And the great thing about Rand is she is she spoke like a character, you know, like she 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 was quite um, articulate and quite. She was so confident in her in her pr- pronouncements that she was qu- quotable, um, and she her voice, you know, really helped me with figuring out the voice for Ryan, because he had the same kind of confidence in his belief system, where I sort of stammer and stutter around. Like, I, wouldn't be good, I wouldn't be a very good voice actor for Andrew Ryan. <laughs> a man has a, you know, I think he's got kind of a choice. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, I, but, I, you know, I think I looked at it and I started, and I'd go back to it occasionally, more for, not for the words, so much as for the, her, her, um, her, her, her pacing. You know, of, hmm. of, of how she spoke. And I don't mean verbally, because I didn't really listen to tapes. I, how she spoke on the page. Um, and because getting his, his rhythm right, you know, there's a lot in common between their rhythms. Uh, just as writers uh, or speakers or, you know, or how they form sentences. But, but less than the specifics of the philosophy. But I think I, under, I think I got it. You know, I read, I read Mountain Ahead and I read that book and I read Anthem and I read half of Atlas Shrugs. Believe it or not, <laughs> was, <laughs> was it too long? Uh, no, it, it was too. It was a bit repetitious. I thought I, I completely understood what she was saying. It was so and obviously I thought it was interesting because you know the whole the whole concept of you know you know rapture is a golf in some ways is golf is a golf is a type of golf golf. Right. But I also took it from. Um, you ever see the mosquito? Read the Mosquito Coast. No. It's about a. Um, Guy forms, he, you know, he leaves America because he says, you know, the, the you know, capitalism is destroying the world. So the opposite, right? Mm. And 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 industry, ca- corporate culture is destroying the world, and there's going to be a nuclear war. And he brings his family, and he's a genius. This guy, he brings his family to uh, the Amazon, and he builds a new society there. You know, very, you know, not in a scale of rapture, like you know, just like a village, basically. Right. And he's got all these inventions about how to make ice. He has an he has an idea of how to make ice in the jungle. And he does it like some chemical process, and then of course, you know, very much like Bioshock, he, you know, he 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 uh, lose being right becomes more important to him than 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 being seem, mm. thinking he's right him more important than what happened to the people around him, and it kind of falls apart. So um, that had a lot that had a lot of inspiration on Bioshock too. That. Uh... That was and that was and that was like a commie dude, right? So uh, I'll, I'll, I'm an equal opportunity oh. um, dystopia guy. Uh, 
absolutely. Um, I. Uh, <clears throat> I took. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Bioshock features some of Ayn Rand's ideas, but I don't think it's about objectivism. Uh, it's about. Let me put it this way. I identify the theme of Bioshock 1 as the danger of certainty or maybe the danger of absolutism. Uh, would you say that's an accurate statement of the main integrating idea of Bioshock? One. Well, I want to preface it by saying that I, I, I'm, a, I'm a limited believer in authorial intent because most people never met me or heard me who played the game. So what mm -hmm. I have to say about it doesn't really matter that much. And I think it's really what you make of it. Um, you know, I read all these academic things about Bioshock and stuff, and most of them are complete. Like compared to what I was thought, mm -hmm. are, com are completely out of left field. Like completely left out of left field. Some of them are really cool. Some of them reflect what I thought, but all but all of them are valid because who cares what I think? Honestly, uh, probably uh, that's probably making you flip out. Too. No, no, no. Well, uh, it's interesting because I agree. Who cares what you think? But I agree with that. If because it's not what everybody thinks. It's uh, once you create it, it's objective. It's not open to anybody's interpretation, or including yours. Uh, it is what it is. Um, well, well, right. It, 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 but people encounter it differently. Is what I'm saying. I encounter it differently than you do, and and whatever its objective form is, does it matter if nobody ever encounters it? Uh, no. But if they do encounter it, it is what it is, and. I don't know, man, because I tell you, it's not to me what it was when I wrote it. Like, it changes, you know, in my head. I don't even re remember it, you know, like exactly what it was. I don't remember exactly all the things I thought when I was making it. It was a well, long time ago. I assure you, if you go back, uh, it's the same game, except maybe the uh, oh, no, no, texture sure, resolutions. I'm sure, I'm sure the bitmaps, you know, like <laughs> the, 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 the code is the same. And I, but what I thought... I don't remember exactly what like each moment what I thought when I was writing something or, or directing something. I could be having a completely different memory of what I actually meant at the time. Right, so right. But that's... there is the objective truth. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know if it exists. Or anybody can decipher it. At least nobody's got a window to it anymore. If I don't, who does? Uh, I think everybody does. Anybody who just looks at it, uh, it speaks for itself. And my view. Yeah, but um, but you take away something very different than somebody else would take away. From well, it. I think there's a right way to take things from it, a wrong way. Uh, <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Yeah. Say you had vetted a right way to uh -huh. view Bioshock with many of your respected peers, right? Uh -huh. And you said, okay, this is the right way, and we're certain that we found the objective truth. Yeah. And I looked at it, and I said, and you told me, you, you called me up on the phone, and you said, Ken, we found the objective truth of Bioshock. <laughs> and I said, you told me, it's really about... You know, chicken farming practices. And, I mean, incidentally, and, this is what I just did. We're we're talking right now. I called you up and I told you what I thought the theme was. So I did do that. Right, but but so so your theme, I agree with you that I think that I agree with it. It's the theme. Mm -hmm. that I believe that's a theme, or certainly a, the dominant theme. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I thought it was when I wrote it. But can I tell you for sure? I don't know. Maybe I thought something else. Like maybe I thought I was writing a lot more about objectivism for a while. Maybe I thought I was writing a lot more about something else. I don't really remember, dude. I can't honestly tell you what I thought at the time. Well, I'm going to use uh, the response you've liked to use so far. Who cares? Yeah. Uh, right, because it speaks for itself. Um, right. But what was your chicken example? What, what were you doing with that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I was saying that you called me up and you said you you had you found the objective truth of the theme of Bioshock and it's about it's an examination of like chicken farming techniques in Indiana in the 1950s or something. Right. And I'd be like, well, I don't know, dude. I'm not sure that's right. Well, and no, I mean you're a certain of it. You know, uh, you know that pop philosopher uh, Zizek. Yeah, he, yeah. Uh, he claims to be a fan of Ayn Rand and uh, he's written in some. Uh, journals I regard as disreputable and I think he says he thinks uh, the Fountainhead is really about how Howard Rourke is a secret lesbian or something uh, so I mean that... I think he sounds like he's trolling you dude no he absolutely I mean he's just a nihilist I... why, why, why does he well, well nihilist it seems to me trolling and nihilism go hand in hand don't they yeah although it can be done for lighter funner purposes but 
not sure. in this case. Um, <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's that doesn't comport with anything about the objective product. Uh, I mean, you can't find any evidence for that in the novel. You can't find any evidence for the chicken farming thing. Now, the most you could say is, you could say, uh, the Concretes of Bioshock express this theme, and this theme has many applications. It covers an infinite number of things in real life. So you could say it applies to real life, this instance of chicken farming or something that that's subsumed under the theme of Bioshock. But all right, all right. So let me try something less jokey. Mm-hmm. What what if it's about parenthood? Uh, I, I don't think my answer changes at all. Um... I mean, it's a story of parents and children, right? Yeah, it's all over the place. Atlas and Fontaine and Ron. <laughs> Jack, sorry, Atlas and, and, and Jack and Ryan and Jack and Tenenbaum and the little sisters and Jack and little sisters and the big daddies and little sisters. It has a lot to do with parenthood, too. Right, but do, I mean, there are enough elements in it that you can see that is not the integrating idea uh, behind all the all the action, all the major elements. Some, some days, but was it an accident? Because certainly... I don't know if I intended that, but there it was, over and over and over and over again, a theme coming back. What it yeah. means, you know, and and you can certainly say it's about choice, right? That or the lack of choice, you know, mm-hmm. video games. That's another thing you can say it's about. Um, you know, talking. It's a postmodern statement about the blah, 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 video games. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that a lot. Right. Have and you? There's oh, some dominant. Th- and 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 if I chose, let's go back and say, let's pretend I don't remember. Or let, let, let's not pretend. Let, let's say let's let's allow for the purpose of debate that I don't remember what the purpose was, right? A, mm-hmm. a, a theme of the game. Well, the fact that the defining moment of it has nothing really to do with objectivism and and, and, and ideology and everything to do with talking about the you know the nature of how we play video games is isn't there a good argument you can make that that's what it's really about? Um. And again, I'm not saying that's what it is. I'm just saying, but one could. In fact, I read those, you know, college. Ed- I read those, you know, doctoral essays on these things. And the truth is, I don't know. That is uh, uh, not auspicious for the next question I'm about to ask, which okay. was. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm disappointing you. Like, <laughs> oh no! I... Like, like you're, you're gonna go home and like you know, stab your Ken Levine voodoo doll with a with a pin. <laughs> Uh, Objectivists use, use voodoo dolls, right? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I, I am Rand Stoke spoke very specifically about voodoo dolls. Right. That's one of the commandments we must follow. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to ask you... Uh, I have to admit, I never understood Bioshock Infinite in terms as clear as those in which I understood the first game. Uh, mm-hmm. It seems to intentionally mislead the player at first into believing that you're going to get the same theme with new concretes. Instead of objectivism, it's going to be something like traditional conservatism, but the danger is the same. S- certainty, unchanging, strident political beliefs. Um, they're deeper than that, beliefs of any kind. Uh, but when the multi dimensional time shifting element came in and. I, 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 sorry, I could not figure it out. I, ha- I have no idea what I think of Infinite. Uh, do you remember what you thought? Because in this case, I am kind of dependent on whatever clues you can give me. Okay. So Infinite was interesting because well, I think that when we started it, uh, I think I made a mistake of, of thinking that I, I don't think the sort of um, the world Comstock had built. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a lot of, there was a lot of, you know, I, I understood Ryan pretty well, mm-hmm. and I and I got him, and I, part of me really admired him, and therefore I could write his world in a much broader perspective. I didn't really see much about Comstock to admire, and I got really, I think that made that world less interesting in a lot of ways, because I couldn't sort of make a case for him, for that world as much. So I, I became much more interested in Elizabeth's story. And the notion, and Booker's story, and the notion of, um, like, like there's certainly a moral argument you can make against Comstock, but that moral argument is so clear, right. you know? Yeah. 
he's just like that guy's a bad guy, you know. And we all know there's a complicated backstory and everything. But at the end of the day, you know, he's doing. There was no nobility in in that in his vision. Um, where I saw some nobility, a lot of nobility in Ryan's vision, for you know, a place where people could do things without the interference of others. You know, like I get that because I'm I'm an anti-authoritarian person. Um, I didn't get concepts for it. So I think as time went on, I couldn't. I was between the combination of the challenges that were happening in the development and the and the sort of my struggling with that theme. And did I really? Could I? Was it really as deep a resident a theme? I sort of said, well, you know, what really excites me about this story is Booker and Elizabeth, um, and the story of Booker's sense. And it really became about Booker's desire to wipe away actions he had done in his life and treat them like they didn't, and and make them like they didn't happen. You know, find the girl and wipe away the dead. Right. And right. can we do that? You know, what is our moral responsibility? And I want to tell it through a, you know. I thought Elizabeth was, you know, an interesting character to sort of. And she was really, she's really the, she's really the main character of that story. She's the one who really goes through the changes, and you know, Booker sort of is a much more passive, even though he's the player's driving him. It's really Elizabeth who's going through the big transformation in the story until the very end. And I became very interested in that transformation of that character, and part of that was working with the actors too. That I developed this relationship with Troy Baker and with Courtney Draper, and I really loved working with them and. We kept developing it, um, and I think it's you know we looked at some of the numbers, sort of you know it sold infinite sold a lot more units than Bioshock One, mm -hmm. but it's probably in many ways not as good of a game. I'd say um, I think some parts of it are great, like the, I really as I said the parts I really fell in love with. Uh, you know I was just talking about now working you know, with that storyline, but it had some deficiencies in, com in comparison. I think, um, and I think that. Um, but it was more popular, which is strange. You know, which is which is which is strange. I think part of that is because we tried to. I, I part of me wanted to make something that was, um, you know, broadly commercial appealing because I'd never done that in my life. Now that I've done that, I sort of that was <laughs> that was that's plenty for me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm going back to making weirder things now right. um, because there are there are sacrifices and compromises you have to make, especially you know when you're doing you have this have this. You know, it, it's just a, there's so much, it's such a bigger thing to manage. Um, I know this is a very long answer. I never really talked about this this way before, um, but yeah, I guess I guess that's the best I can say. It, it evolved over time, I guess. And if you, if you ask me what it's really about, I'm not even really sure. <laughs> so I'm just gonna have to every time I play it, I'm just gonna have to try to swim through. Well, try next time if you play it again. Try to say like, who's Elizabeth? What's her story? Like, what what's she saying? Especially if you fall and um, and if you get a chance, the barrel at sea, she goes back to you know Elizabeth go, ends up in Rapture, and there's an intersection of those two worlds. Yeah, I um, yeah, I played I played both of those, um, and uh, I actually <laughs> I always liked. There's a little touch in there where it says, uh, Ryan the lion always shoots to kill. And I like that because it told me how I should play. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was nice to, you know, be given a. If you're on this general uh, axis, then this is the way for you. Although, I, th I think I got my brother to play it totally stealthily non-lethal just because I wanted him to get the trophy uh, Taffer's Delight which I, I don't know why but that's the funniest thing in the world to me I think I laughed for five minutes the first you time know the you know the reference oh yeah yeah okay yeah um, <laughs> yeah my brother and I always joke about Taffer that is such a funny made up swear I assume it's made up um, yeah I think I don't remember if I made that one up or not you know, we tried to come up with a, you know aspects of a language that were different than the real world language. And Bioshock's the same way. Bioshock, you know, the dialogue, especially in Bioshock One, the dialogue in Bioshock One is the Spicer dialogue is sort of a, a pastiche of like guys and dolls theater present, you know, theater night and 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 film noir. Yeah. And then Miller's Crossing, Coen Brothers film, it's a sort of mixture of all those things. Mm. And then Ayn Rand, of course. Yes, yeah, so I'd say go go back and play it as go back and play and just like think if you go back and play it, 
Mm-hmm. What, what is Elizabeth's story, and, and how does she fit into the larger scheme of things? She's the unifying element. Okay. Um, this probably isn't hard to guess, but I'm a very literal-minded person. So whenever time travel gets involved, I or multidimensional stuff, I find it very hard to follow. And yep. I don't really know... Is that an essential element there? Uh, I, do you think it's necessary to understand exactly? No, I mean, I could explain to you the relevant part in five seconds. Uh, yeah. Well, if it's that easy, I assume I already got it the first time through, unless I'm just... I, I, mean, there, I mean, there's certainly a lot of sort of, like, nuances that are more complex, but the basic story we're trying to tell is about a person who who split, basically, and one mm-hmm. became one person, one man became the other, one became another person, and what that meant for his life, and what it meant for his life, and for the life of his child. Do you, but uh, it's all about it's all about accepting or denying responsibility. Do you believe in free will? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, free will in the sense of not any kind of weaselly compatibilist definition. But I mean, <laughs> you could have done things. I'm guessing you find all, almost all my beliefs some degree of weaseliness. <laughs> no, no, absolutely, absolutely <laughs> not. If you're a determinist, I mean, you know what Ayn Rand said. Uh, well, you probably don't, but. Uh, I probably get what, what did she say? What did she say? Um, there are two sides to every issue. One side's right, one side's wrong. The middle <laughs> is always evil. <laughs> so, <laughs> she, 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 she is a she has a Manichean was it Manichean, Manichean? right? Manichean view yeah. of the universe, which I do not. <laughs> right, but um, but I but I like her. I still like her in a lot of ways. We just have a totally different view of the universe. <laughs> I assume no. that will go. Uh, that will become less and less. Uh, what? Your uh, liking of Ayn Rand? Um, no, it, I didn't, my feelings about her haven't changed at all. Okay, okay. Um, I, 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 I think people take themselves like I think people take a lot of these things far too seriously. Like, um, I think honestly, you know, like, uh, and I'll probably just be like, I'm probably some kind of cosmic goofball, but you know, because you're you believe in something, and I unfortunately like the, last, the older I've gotten, the less I. I had I had an experience of re- having grew up in a scenario where I had some very um, my parents were kind of tough they were rough to sometimes and they were they demanded a lot of me and I owe a lot of my success to them but in the end there were things they spoke about mm-hmm. that with great conviction that in the end of their lives they didn't really have those convictions mm. it turns out and the most important ways you can demonstrate a certain type of responsibility and a love and caring for you know a, a person in your life there are ways that they they didn't sort of they weren't the people entirely they said they were in many ways they were and and as i said i owe a lot of my success to them um and people are complicated but as i've gotten older i find there's less and less i actually think is reliable and believable and more and more just we're just a bunch of animals scared animals trying to you know crawl across the planet without getting eaten um and that's that's kind of scary you know it's kind of that doesn't mean i don't have values i don't think things are right or wrong or that that for some reason i feel it's right to act you know things like the golden rule that old boring rule (laughs) but i i think it's pretty chaotic out there and i think if anything you know um you know, history demonstrates that we're. Well, somebody once said we're four. We're four square. We're four square meals away. Miss, four, we're missing. Mm. We're missing four square. Sorry, the phrase. <laughs> if we miss basically, if we miss four square meals, we'd all we'd be at each other's throats. Where that civilization is that close to falling apart at all times, and I'm not sure that's not true. And that's scary, but it also makes you have to be an adult and say, nobody's got the answers for me, man. I just got to do the best I can. Hmm. Well, uh, as far as taking yourself seriously goes, uh, I just want to say that on my OkCupid profile, I specifically tell people, anybody who has, any woman who has on her profile, I'd like a guy who doesn't take herself seriously. Just avoid me at all costs. Um, because <laughs> you, you take yourself yeah I like it though man it's very refreshing at least you're on, like you, you have a passion you're honest about it um, I, I like that I like that about you 
I'm glad. Um, so, free will. Uh, in the sense that you could have done otherwise than you did. You believe in that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, that's interesting. That's something, you know, anybody who's at all intellectual today and not religious, it's almost dogma that, I mean, how could you have free will? The world's material, everything has cause and effect, so of course what you do is just determined by preceding events. Um, you know, I wrote a play once. Mm -hmm. you, you keep going to these very these these minefields of mine. I wrote a play once called <laughs> House of Creon, which is my, this is, you want to talk about taking yourself seriously, I wrote a play, I wrote two plays adapting Greek classics to a sort of a, mm -hmm. a modern sensibility. Mm -hmm. So one was a hodgepodge of stuff. Well, one, one was a, one was an adaptation of Lysistrata, a Greek play called Lysistrata, a serious quote, serious adaptation of it. Mm -hmm. um, which probably you'll see a little bit of Elizabeth in, the, in my Lysistrata, and sort of that mm -hmm. that sort of, they were my two real heroines I ever wrote, I think. Um, and then I wrote a thing called House of Creon, which is sort of a pastiche of a lot of different, um, you know, the whole Oedipus cycle. Right. Um, and there's a speech at the end where Creon, you know, where Creon realizes that, you know, he he's like Oedipus, does all these tragic mistakes, ends up in this shitty, horrible situation. Like his wife, I think, can't even remember. I wrote a whole play about like, can't remember. <laughs> wife kills himself, kills herself, lights herself on fire. I can't remember. I uh, can't remember exactly the details, but terrible things happen. And he meets up with uh, the, I think it was the ghost of Antigone, who of course he had had killed. Mm -hmm. And she gives him this speech where she says like. And he's like, well, I'm, my, I'm fated. I was fated to do all these, make all these mistakes. The gods cursed me, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, well, yeah, the gods can fate you to sort of live in this house, this one house that you don't like. But it's up to you to decide whether you live in the basement or in, you know, or in, this, or in, the, in the sun mm -hmm. of it. There's always a range that you have right. agency over. And so, yeah, there are a lot of things that, that control us. But I believe that I've seen in life... I, I, we have some degree of agency, and some of us have much more, and some of us have much less. Um, there's always a, a some degree of agency, and it's that doesn't mean it's going to be good enough, but it allow, but it's you should always be trying to maximize your agency. Uh, I completely agree. I'm surprised to say that. Look at that. <laughs> um, have you thought about? Uh, why you believe it, or is it just something you think? Well, I could be wrong about anything, including this. Or I mean, what do you say when? I mean, sure. I don't know if well, you've ever talked about this to someone, but if you have, they must tell you that free will is an old-fashioned superstition. Well, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. If there, what's the point of worrying about it if there's no free will, right? <laughs> you, so the fact that I worry about it means I think they have free will. That I think about it because. Oh, sorry, these means I've chosen that I believe I have free will, because really, if there is no free will, and you're, I'm, I'm saying I'm for it, and you're saying you're again it, what does it matter? Because we're both wrong, because we're we're in that conversation not by choice. So it's, it's, it becomes a bit academic and a bit boring um, to even contemplate, because one, if there if there is no free will, why, then the whole conversation is moot. Uh, that's true, but so why have like, why is he even having the conversation? Well, why bother? Because if there is free will, but somebody believes there isn't, that's a big problem. I mean, then they just give up responsibility for their own lives and happiness completely. Well, it's only a problem if, if you know, unless you, you know, in their person, you know them personally. It's only a problem for you if they, if they, you know, get it, if they violate the space of your nose, you know, from a libertarian perspective. Oh, no, I mean, I'm, <laughs> look, I care about other people, so... Right. So not. yeah. So you want you want somebody you love to to believe in free will. But let yeah. me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. What if you're wrong? Then um. Then you were sort of the the sucker who was forced to make the argument at, against reality, right? Yeah. Except that's not possible. I I'm definitely <laughs> right, and I mean I can prove it. I I believe God is easily disproven in five seconds. Although even the most famous atheists can't seem to grasp this because they. Very bad philosophical premises, but yeah, I mean, you mean you mean that it'd be about about not being a proven negative? Well, no, there's 
there are two conceptions of God. One is he is just some powerful being that influences us. That that is the issue of the arbitrary. That is the issue of not being able to prove a negative. That is just it's disconnected from reality. There's nothing uh, to think about. De- that's a deist view. That's a view that that root that Franklin held in Jefferson. Um, kind of. Although I think it's slightly different. In well, well, they said that, that God set everything in motion and hung back. Right, but that's less of a statement of his power and and his nature than it is his methodology. Uh, it's still, you know, I mean, that's Aristotle's prime mover, consciousness right. contemplating right. itself. Um, I think that's still disproven because it has contradictory elements, but I'm just thinking like a, a powerful alien or something, which is, that's an arbitrary conception. But when you say God is omniscient, omnipotent, uh, unable by his nature to be grasped by man. He's infinite. He's not bound by time or identity. He can perform miracles, which means violating the law of identity, the nature of reality. There's nothing else you need to know. Are you getting to the point where you're saying, and his son was in Bethlehem on such and such a year? Like, are you getting a level of detail? Uh, That doesn't even matter. Okay, okay. So you're saying saying let's abstract it to a higher level than that even. Right, that's that's completely irrelevant. The point is, miracles are impossible by the nature of reality. I'm not uncertain about that. I'm not agnostic. I know they're impossible. Any being that is claimed to exist that can perform them is, by that fact, impossible. Well, look, cer- certainly, certainly, um, the supernat like the supernatural is outside of, by definition, is outside of things that we define as natural, right? Now, certainly things become, things that, things become that we would call supernatural or science fiction become fact eventually. So, some do, no, no, sorry, not, a, not, not all by any imagination, but, it's, but a proportion do. Like for instance, you know, space travel, right? Became reality, right? But once it was fiction, now it's reality. Um, so the question is, is that, you, so, with a limited understanding of the universe, I think it's fair to say that we don't actually know a lot of things. I think it's fair to say there's no, it's no more likely that God, the God you described exists than, you know, leprechauns exist. Because there's no evidence supporting either one. Uh, well, I think they're... Uh, you know, are you for leprechauns? Are you a part of like a, a, an objectivist leprechaun? Thing? <laughs> well, leprechauns are outside of the scale of probability. Because arbitrary. So is God. So is God. No, God. No, 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 no. No, God oh. is on the scale as definitely false. Because a leprechaun is just something arbitrary. You have no evidence for it. There's nothing to talk about. You can't disprove it. Because uh, there's nothing in the nature of reality that means one is impossible as far as we know. But we just have no evidence. But with God everything you know about reality the basic fundamental nature of reality god violates that so uh, i mean it's it would be just like saying uh not that there's a leprechaun uh somewhere i don't see him but that he's visible right in front of me well he's not visible right in front of me that statement is false so while i don't disagree with you let me disagree with you okay so let's put aside God for a second. Okay. Let's talk about reality. You just said because he is he's not consistent. It he she it whatever is not consistent with reality, right? Yeah. I don't really God. I wasn't like I wasn't trying to correct your your your, your grammar there. Um, yeah, yeah. So your understanding of reality changes all the time. Like the Newtonian understanding of reality is quite different than the Einsteinian understanding of reality. The the if such a thing like many worlds theories. Is, is you know comes out turns out to be true. That's going to be the understanding of reality than the, than the current understanding of reality. And if the fifteen things we find beyond that, which we're likely to, I mean, hell, there are microwaves. Where were they for the past hundred thousand years? Well, they were there, right? We just didn't know about them. Um, um, I should stop you before you go on. Uh, uh, there's nothing that has been discovered about reality that has violated the fundamental. <laughs> existence time there's two things you can say about existence. our perception of time i completely disagree with you about our perception of time 
Uh, I don't understand. What do you mean? The time, the time is not an, a river necessarily going in one direction. Oh, I think it absolutely is. Time is a measurement of motion. To say that it could go in an opposite direction is not to say that you can, you know, walk 10 feet and then walk backwards. It would be the equivalent of saying that you can walk negative distances. Okay, so well, I wasn't saying opposite direction. I was saying that it's not. it doesn't actually go in a direction. Now, you can say entropy implies that. But there is, you know, there, if if there's potential in modern physics, a fair amount of modern physics, that just just the very nature of singular flow of time through a singular series of events is not accurate. Now that that could also turn out to be wrong, but there could be it could to be 15 theories away from what's actually the truth. Well, I don't think it could at all because you're reifying time here. Time is not some independent thing. Time is. A measurement of motion. Nothing is ever going to contradict that. Um, I, 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 I think I like to hear Newton say that to Einstein. <sighs> and I'm, I'm not recovering myself to Einstein here. I'm saying the future has a way of surprising you. And I'm not saying I know how it's going to surprise you. In fact, that's my point. Uh, is that I, I don't think you're going to know how the future is going to surprise you. And certain that's, you know, and look, what is this larger debate about? It's about certainty, right? And right. versus versus uncertainty. The, the the people through history have been made fools by, of by time and by the future over and over again. Well, there's a difference here between figuring out scientific truths, which you can definitely be mistaken on. We don't know everything about them. People might make a mistake today. They find out it's wrong tomorrow. Now, I, I don't think that violates certainty. It, even that does. But I'm talking about something even deeper than that. I'm talking about axioms. I hereby guarantee you no one will ever find out, nobody will ever discover scientifically that existence doesn't exist or that existence doesn't have identity, that a thing isn't what it is. Those are uh, absolutely... I, I guarantee you someone will figure out existence isn't exactly what we think it is. I can pretty much guarantee you because our understanding of existence is very... Isn't. But whatever it is, it is, right? Right, but it may be well, something very different than what we well, think it is now. Well, that's not what I'm, t I'm talking about. The people fact who say it's a simulation, I'm not saying I agree with them. I'm saying there's lots <laughs> of people who, 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 who probably are pretty smart. I've met one of them. You know, who's like the smartest guy I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. He's pretty certain it's a simulation. I'm not saying I agree with him. I'm saying he's not an idiot. So he's, a, he's probably a person who may debate you on some of these things. Well, okay. I wouldn't um, debate you because I'm not smart enough to debate you on the topic. But he um, could. I don't think that's... Uh, I mean... Uh, I mean, the idea of the universe as a simulation just violates every epistemological standard possible. So uh, how, how dare it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the nerve of it. <laughs> I know, I know. It, <laughs> look, look I, I, I'm Rudo Charles. I'm super happy for you because uh -huh. you were born apparently at exactly the right time no, in history, where the, all you had gotten to the, where all the truths had no, just been. No, 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 no. You don't understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying I know everything about the nature of the universe. Uh, you agreed yourself. Whatever the nature of the universe is, that's its nature, right? Even if we don't know it now, whatever it is, it is. It's a, I mean, it's a bit it's a bit tautological put that way, but sure. No, no, it's not. It's not tautological. It's not just words. I mean, if you want to call it, well, uh, there's this, this tautology, separate question. Can you actually? Can anybody actually see that truth? Right. Yes, it's self-evident. No, can anyone ever see the truth? Uh, what do you mean? Well, here, look, this goes. This is exactly what it's about. So you say there is an objective truth to something, right? Yeah. You also say you can see it with 2020 vision. Uh, and I can look at that same truth. I can look at that same thing, and I will see something different. Is that because my vision is bad? Are you talking about literal perceptual vision? No, no. My ability to understand it. My ability to okay. understand the thing. Perceive the thing, understand the thing, rock the thing. Rock it, right? Let's use rock, uh, right? That's the right word. <laughs> No, you don't like rock? No, uh, I do not that, like rock. Is that a Heinlein Rand fight I, I didn't know about? Uh, well, I mean, uh, Heinlein's okay, but I don't know. Okay, let's, I don't want to get away from rock. <laughs> um, if rock is troublesome, I withdraw it. Well, I'm just trying to get... Okay, I kind of understand where you're going, but I don't, I don't understand concretely what you mean. What would it mean for two people to understand something differently? I don't... 
for, well, well, for the you, truth, to be, for the conceptual truth to be different no, no, for two different no, people. No, I, I'm not saying. Like, so here's the truth, right? Mm -hmm. It is what it is. A is A, right? Okay. Yeah. You look at it, uh -huh. and you think it's this. You think it's something, right? Uh -huh. You think it's X, I think it's Y. Right. We both, I think Y equals A, right? You think X equals A. Okay. How do we know which one of us is right? Um, we, know, we, we know we agree we agree a is a but 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 my perception of it is is my x your or is what x and yours is y how do we know y equals a or x equals a how do we know which one's right you can have to concretize it i don't i'm not really good with symbols like that um so uh, what would an a be give me an well, a give me the x give me the y give me a real okay. example so a, a is the objective truth right what truth let's say e any truth. There is there is a truth, right? You you think there's objective truth, right? Yeah. So, here it is. Okay. You perceive it, I perceive it, right? All right. Whatever, eyes, hearing, whatever it is, we, we both use our ability to perceive it. Okay. And I go, aha, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, I'm going to describe that truth to you. Mm -hmm. And what I describe is X, right? Right. You say, I'm going to describe that truth to you. Mm-hmm. That truth is, is, let's call that Y. Mm-hmm. X is not equal Y. Okay. That's happened many times, right? Somebody's come down from the mountain, I said, I saw this, and somebody else comes down from the mountain, I said, so I saw that. So, okay. if we have a different description of, of, of A, mm -hmm. how do we know who's right? Well, it entirely depends on what you're talking about. Um, are you talking, I mean, again, this, if you mean what you literally saw, that's a completely different thing, but if... No, no, what, what, what I took away... Well, it's what I describe it as, right? So, like, the thing exists, but but until it's, till we put it into the world, you know, uh, give give me what you believe to be an objective truth. Um, there's a bottle of wine sitting on this table right in front of me. Now, what if I looked at it and I thought I said and I thought, is it a bottle of green wine? Is, let's say it's a bottle, a green bottle of wine, right? Uh, the bottle is green. Yeah. Okay. Is that an objective truth? The bottle was green. Uh, yeah, it is. All right. So I look at it, right? Mm -hmm. Now I'll start with the start with the nuance of it. And I say, well, the bottle is green. Uh -huh. We both agree that. But in reality, and the science, there's some science to support this. What you see as green is actually quite different than what I see and identify as green. And we're actually taking in different things. Okay. You don't understand what I'm talking about. You know the science I'm talking about. Oh, I, I totally understand. So what is it? Uh, is, is, do we share a same green? And this, and this is not even getting to the larger point I was making before. This is a, this is a more of a wrinkle on that. Yeah, is I mean, it, this what, is what's an, green? Um, it is both in a different context. I mean, it isn't intrinsically green. It appears green to somebody with your uh, ocular equipment, and it appears yellow to the person with a different physical seeing apparatus I mean, there, there's no intrinsic truth of it but it's objective because you're not saying what is it in itself you're saying what does it look like means what does it look like to someone there's no what does it look like in right. general right but how do we know once we get down to that level of specific so let's now say it's a piece of philosophy right mm -hmm. you hear it i hear it it's, it's all in the it's in the language somebody says it and i say you know what i i think that means I, I know that means this, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Congress shall make no law there, um, regarding the establishment of religion, right? Mm -hmm. I hear that, and it's very clear to me what that means. You hear that. And I'm not saying we actually have a difference of opinion on this topic, but just for argument's sake. Right. You think it means something quite different. Mm -hmm. We're both hearing the same words. We're both, we both think there's an objective truth there, right? Right. So, but, but, our, view, but our view is so different. How do you explain that? Uh, because someone is lacking the appropriate context. Somebody doesn't understand English or doesn't understand how English was used in that time or hasn't conceptualized enough to understand what a certain concept covers or doesn't. All right, so let's step back further. Let's say you could go, which what happens is um, in law sometimes, mm -hmm. though it's not as valuable as the contract itself. So the contract here is, is very vague. Right. Some degree, right? I, 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 
I would think it's probably less vague than some other people in terms of that I could probably, like you, could talk about what the est- an established religion is, right? It doesn't mean um, it, there was a, it was a state. Each state had an established religion in the colonial times, and so they were trying to fight back against that. That you know, I think it was Georgia's Catholic, and you know, and and Connecticut was something else, and Rhode Island was started by a bunch of separatists who fled the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, but so, but, but let's say we both had a, you know sort of a shared understanding of what an establishment meant. We, we, we sort of cleared up all those sort of. Um, you know, we clear up all those factors. Mm-hmm. It's still pr- it's still pretty vague. And if you go back and you read different um, people who wrote who wrote the Declar who wrote the Constitution and then mm-hmm. the Bill of Rights, um, you, you might it might it'd be hard to interpret sometimes what their view of it was. You know, Madison said, "Oh, the reason we didn't include the mention of God was because we forgot." Um, and what he meant was just sort of a joke, saying, "You know, in my interpretation." was and he didn't say exactly those words i'm paraphrasing mm-hmm. is that it was so irrelevant to the conversation that they didn't it didn't even come up for them and but well, somebody else can read that and say well it means that he they it was a you know they were very busy and they they meant to come back and put a whole bunch about you know jesus in there um we have different opinions of of, of that law wouldn't we um Maybe, but we don't have to, and there's a right opinion. I mean, this is no different from if somebody scribbles a random marking on a page and says, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. Or it means uh, all of the interpretations at once and none of them in the sense that it simply represents that different people wrote it down without understanding what they were writing. You can't get... You can't get... so what do you think? What do you think of the constitutional interpretations of say, of Congress should make no law bridging the right of free speech, or whatever? I'm paraphrasing again. But what would you make in terms of the additions that have been added to that law in terms of things like you know fighting words, or um, or or, or um, 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 pornography and things like that? Would you think those are people actually interpreting the objective truth of that law, or do you think that they were mi- misreading that? I think they were misreading it. Okay. Um, so you'd call yourself an originalist? No, I would not. Um, oh, actually, you're there's misreading it. What? There's a. I mean, uh, if you are interested in this, which may not be the case, but there is a. There's an objectivist legal scholar called Dr. Tara Smith, and she has a whole book on originalism and interpretation of the Constitution and legal documents. If if you care about that, but no, I'm I, I'm inter- look, I, It's an interesting topic because it's. Um, you know, I don't think people realize how unfortunately. Well, I don't know if it's fortunate or intentional. Mm-hmm. How how sketchily outlined the Bill of Rights is always struck me as just terrifyingly vague. But you could go back and make an argument, and I'm not saying I believe this argument mm-hmm. that they intended to be terrifyingly vague because they didn't want it to be overly structured so it could be a living document. Who knows? Well, I don't think that's. The alternative. Really I don't think... Are they lazy? <laughs> and I'm not even saying I believe what I just said. I'm just saying it is weird that it's so vague. Maybe, although I'm not sure they intended it to be vague. I don't know. Um... I mean, Jesus, when those guys want to write, we intend these truths to be self-evident that all men are created blah, 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 and they will go on forever and that's great right they, they said some beautiful things yeah but the, but the bill of rights is like no congress will make no laws blah, 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 blah. well i mean it, i mean that's it you know the second amendment right right very brief very open to a lot of different interpretation not if you really didn't want to write a document that wasn't open to interpretation that's probably not the document we would have written well no 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 i mean you cannot that's the whole thing with the interstate commerce clause you cannot write something that just compels people to understand what you meant if somebody wants to misinterpret something they can do it i mean yeah. they now yeah. regulate interstate commerce i mean intrastate commerce on the grounds of the interstate commerce clause because yeah. it affects economic demand in other states if you, you can get there from there you can get anywhere from anywhere you're not going to find a debate for me on the overextension of interstate commerce laws and the, the and crackdown on freedoms uh, as such. Um, but that said, 
you know, that's a, but there's also a federalist versus, you know, a state's, you know, argument to be made there as well. Um, and people probably here don't understand how, what a, what a confederation of states it was at the beginning. Right. Versus, yeah. and, 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 you know, the whole struggle between Hamilton and Jefferson, you know, for the musical, um, <laughs> you know, what that meant, and the whole notion of, 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 of early republicanism, which is very different from current republicanism. Um, it's the, um, well, in some ways, in some ways not. Um, but, you know, people don't really understand what what a confederation of states it was, that it wasn't really a country right. at the beginning. Well, I mean, that's my point. If you go back and look at that context, it becomes clear what that interstate commerce clause was supposed to mean. A lot of, I mean, this is a popular view among objectivists to say that the interstate commerce clause was a mistake in the Constitution, but I don't think it was. Uh it had an objective and valid meaning and legitimate purpose, but you can misinterpret anything. So that was yeah. I mean, if you, if you read the history of the early of the early United States, you know, originally it had no power to tax. Right. You know, yeah. it, it it really couldn't do anything. And what happened is they started having all these, um, you know, they couldn't pay the soldiers, you know, from the war, and they started getting all these rebellions on their hands because they owed the people money and nobody wanted to pay for the war. Um, and so they started taxing people, and they did it to put to, because there was going to be another revolution, you know. Like, and I'm sure you know all this, um, but people don't. And so, yes, yeah, so people are missing that that context. But it, I think we share the context, you and I. Sounds mm-hmm. like we share the context. I'm not sure I agree with you that the Constitution wasn't overly vague, even given the context, because those people are also smart enough to know that people forget context. Yeah, but even if you wanted to, it's an impossible assignment to specify <laughs> to specify everything you don't know what's going to come so you can't do it right but 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 the, but the, but the but they could very specifically call out what they want to say like the declaration is a great example as a very yeah, yeah, yeah. comprehensively yeah. written statement a message to king george it's a declaration of independence hey fuck you king george we're breaking off from you and reality where they really could have said is hey george sayonara and that would have been enough right Mm-hmm. But they went on for pages and pages <laughs> of, about it. You know, they did not have the First Amendment, the the the, the Bill of Rights, or or Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. You know, brevity is the soul of wit. Notion about them, so they really gave it to old George in that document. Yeah, but I mean, that's... to be specific, they could be specific, and I'm not sure why they were really that incredibly vague. About well, I think that. it's clear. Yes, because... it was wisdom, it took some degree of wisdom on their part. Yeah, uh, I mean. All the enumerated uh, grievances against King George the th- King George the Third were, I mean, that was a specific instance. That was the catalyst for the break. So it was fine to enumerate it. But when you're laying down a Bill of Rights or a Constitution, you have to the principles have to be broad. It's not vague. It's broad because they're going to cover things <laughs> as well, long as the country exists. Yeah, but you know it's funny. Mm-hmm. That how much the the constitute the Bill of Rights and the Constitution line up to the Declaration because what they were basically trying to do with the Bill of Right with the Constitution was saying, let's make sure what happened with King George never happens again, mm-hmm. right? That's why you want a well-armed militia, right? Because and we, we can debate about the meanings of the beyond that. Let, let's just not even get to debate whether it means anything beyond the militia, but to just say certainly you want a well at least a well-armed militia because we you that's what kick that's what kicked those fuckers out of Boston the first time, mm-hmm. right? And we want freedom of speech because we use the press and freedom of the press um, to spread our message about George. You know, freedom of assembly. We want freedom of assembly because we remember what happened to the Boston Massacre. Um, they were, it was just the revolution over and over again. Mm-hmm. Because that's what you do when you're when you just had a bad problem. You say, let's make sure that never happens again. And that's your entire focus. You're fighting yesterday's battle, and that's what the Constitution was in a lot of ways. They they were refighting the revolution and making sure they never got in that that spot again. And when you compare sort of the the beat by beat of the of of what happened in the revolution and the Constitution, it, it will you walk away kind of stunned at how specific it was to the problem to the problem they had just gone through. Yeah, but I don't think it was that parochial. Um, I think it was much more. I mean, I believe in the power of philosophy, so I think this was much more. Uh, they were men of action who 
they weren't really intellectuals themselves, the Founding Fathers, I mean. Um, they were just putting into... Jefferson? I mean... The dude just, like, pranced around the mansion, you know, writing shit and studying plants. You know, he's a yeah. fucking intellectual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fucking... I, I didn't mean... I meant... Uh, they were... Uh, uh, Adams, you know, it's a lawyer. Right, but they were more narrowly political. They were not original philosophical thinkers. Um, but they were putting into practice the ideas of, I mean, ultimately Aristotle through John Locke. But um, Yeah, but they were the first people really to do it in, in real time in a real government. I mean, right, pretty, yeah. That's, that's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. All that's great as philosophy. They were able to take that philosophy and build... You know, especially the the division of powers and in, 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 in right. The that's that's their contribution. Yes, um, and that's brilliant. That's you know, right. That's brilliant. Yes, and and and, and that, that didn't spring out of their head like like Athena popping out mm -hmm. of Zeus. Mm -hmm. They worked that problem. You know, yeah, the Federalist Papers, right? Yes, um, but I don't think they would have been able to come up with uh, or been motivated to come up with. Their they needed uh, they needed the soil to to grow those ideas. And, uh, yeah, I understand. I understand. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't just a reaction to the revolution, but it's funny when you when you look at it from that perspective, how much how that a lot of it that it seems less purely sprung out of philosophy than I originally thought it did. Um, hmm. but I thought it was purely a product of the Enlightenment until I sort of really dug into the history of the period and realized there was a lot of connection between what had happened the, over the time over the past 10 years. And I think there's not a lot of people who don't, you know, their lives aren't heavily influenced by a traumatic 10 year event they went through. Mm -hmm. um, and think how traumatic it was. I mean, you think about the unrest in the country now. Are you, are you, you're in America? Yes. Yeah. I'm in Georgia. Uh, yeah. I guess. And so, you know, whatever degree people feel differently, but everybody feels a sense of unrest and, and, and they wish it would sort of, you know, everybody wish that, it wasn't as tense. Can you imagine what it's like during a revolution? Mm -hmm. You know, that's traumatic. Of course you're going to react to that. Yeah, although uh, you could say the revolution was uh, caused by the ideas that ultimately led to the rest. So it's, still, it's not like the revolution was something that happened to them. Well, um, y yes, but I'm telling you, when you when you unleash, you know, the whirlwind, mm -hmm. I think people, nobody knows where it goes, and nobody knows what that's going to be like. You know, n nobody expects the carnage, and nobody ex very rarely have things turned out to be as smooth as people thought. I mean, you know, Adams, what happened to to Boston? You know, Adams saw terrible things you know happening in boston you know it was it was probably you know that city was under siege for months and months and months can you imagine to be in a city under siege by by what seemed by a foreign power for months how traumatic that must be people getting arrested and you you don't know like now we're worried about posting on facebook something politically unpopular it's going to get people yell at us you might you could a lot worse can happen to you back then if you if you say the wrong thing around the wrong group of people you're a, too, you're a Tory, you're a little too Tory or a little mm -hmm. too Patriot, you're going to get in big trouble. Yeah. Um, That's dramatic. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I saw how traumatized you get talking about politics. Like, <laughs> you're a passionate guy. You would you would be, I want to see you after, the, after 10 years of that. Like, if there was like a, a, a revolutionary war between, you know, the objectivists and the... Uh, you know somebody else. Um, you can traumatized at the end of that, man. I I feel bad for you. I you know I'd be like that dude. had went through a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I don't care how philosophically sound you are. You'd be upset. I mean, philosophy doesn't mean you you don't give up your emotions when you become interested yeah. in philosophy. And you'd be changed, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think so. But it wouldn't change my fundamental outlook. I don't think, unless you don't think you don't know. You don't think. Well, I don't think because I have free will, so I can always... But I know it's possible for it not to change if I decided to go that way. Um, uh, so I guess we're a long way off from from the existence of God here. Uh, <laughs> uh, but 
my point. Well, I already said what I thought about that. So, should um, we throw a moat to to the people want to talk about hear about the game? Um, you want to keep talking about God? I'm happy to do either one. Uh, no, we can go no. back to that. Um, I'm happy either way. <laughs> I just where I bored when I start talking about like start talking about John Locke, which I will talk about forever, right? Yeah. Obviously, we I wonder if we're, I wonder if we're reaching the bleachers. Um, I don't know. I th- um I have a. I mean, this is. I mean, this podcast is primarily philosophical, but anytime I have wiggle room, I go to video games. So, <laughs> we're, whatever we do with within these things, that's that's fine. I'm. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm having a good time. So. But I, I admire you and, and your and your I really do, Charles. I admire your your willingness to 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 have that moral courage. Uh, well, thanks for that. Um, hopefully, you have it a dog. Uh, I had a dog. Uh, my girlfriend constantly pesters me to get one. Um, get a dog. It'll make you less certain about everything. <laughs> you won't know what's going on. <laughs> You know what they do. They're like bundles of fucking chaos. Yeah, that's true. They develop some strange habits. Uh, <laughs> they do. They're, they're crazy. I love them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just don't know if I'd want a dog or a cat. I, I love both. No, no, no. You need a dog, dude, because you are like already like cat and precise and thoughtful. And you need something <laughs> that comes in and fucks with your fucks with your 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 your, your zen your zen man. <laughs> you need chaos in your life. <laughs> well, the problem with the dog, I mean this, uh, I can't get work done. Every time I leave, every time I look at my dog, I play with the dog for forty five minutes and just. It takes yeah. up so much time, I can't resist. Um, uh, you, you know, I didn't have a dog until three years ago, and I told my wife I was never getting a dog, never having kids, and she just <laughs> wore me down. And I was like, no, that's not me, that's not me. And then, But I have to tell you, yes, he does distract me from work. Yeah. I think I'm better because of him. I think I'm a better writer because of him. I think because there are parts of me that I explored that didn't, I didn't know existed before, that I would want to take care of this thing. Really? Yeah, hmm. it open it, and now you had a dog, so it'd be less of a delta for you. Yeah. But it's, you know, I think a dog's different at different points in your life. Um, you're gonna call you're gonna call me up. You're gonna get a dog, and you call me like a tears, like, dude, I'm now a moral relativist. <laughs> well, <laughs> now you're not gonna get a dog. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I already know about dogs, so they've had what effect on me they're gonna have, uh, except wasting my time. Um. <laughs> All right, don't get it up. I still might. I don't know. I like him. Um, get it up. Get it up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I'm even he, my dog. <laughs> What's your dog's name? Kirby. I said. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Kirby. Yeah, Kirby, right. Kirby. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, He's boy. <laughs> yeah, I just. I also don't know if I could take an animal dying. I. Okay, don't even, please don't even talk about this. I can't. Okay. I can't. Okay. This is this is trigger warning for Ken Levine. This is right. this is my trigger warning. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know a guy who <laughs> actually Ayn Rand's intellectual heir says that he uh if a dog becomes prominent in a novel, he will just put it down because he knows they're not going to become prominent unless something tragic happens and he can't take it. And you know people I, I was always like I don't care, you know, I write about the darkest subjects. And there's actually a dog gets killed in Bioshock One. I would never write that scene now, and it's not like I object to the scene from like 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 I would want other people to write it, but I couldn't write that scene now mm. because of this dog has opened up a tiny bit of humanity in my dead soul. <sighs> I was just talking to my girlfriend about if there's anything what it says about someone if they react more strongly to dogs than say little kids, like if that incites more nothing good probably (laughs) yeah I'm not so sure I think it's just uh, different things about animals they're kind of incapable of not being innocent so there's no doubt whatsoever when you see you know what it what you know what it is too is that the delta between a natural child and a child in a video game is huge 
Mm. Delta between a dog in a video game and a dog in in real life is less because dogs are you know, they, you know, in terms of per, you know seeing them for a few seconds, like you know they don't the dogs serve sort of, they share a lot of traits at least so we could you know they may have infinitely complex emotional lives but we just can't perceive it. So there's there's a lot of similarities in dogs. They they, they read a lot more. You see a Karen Terrier, he reminds you of your Karen Terrier probably. Mm. Where you see a white kid, it doesn't necessarily remind <laughs> your white kid. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, or a black kid, or an Asian kid, or whatever, or whatever, however you want to categorize. Hmm. I don't think capitalism is amoral. I don't think you can make anything amoral. And the Ghostbusters is an example of that. It did not do well in the box office from what uh, I think I remember. Um, I think that was promoted for ideological reasons. And in the same way, people will completely pass on absolutely profitable things if they think they're immoral. That's what happened to the atlas shrugged movie for decades people knew it would be massively profitable but nobody would do it because was it profitable when they made it no but that it was made in a completely different way they they well, well, well my after a is, while no this would be completely profitable that's you know that's not how that business works well no no I mean, I mean there was every reason to think because of the just a not like unprecedented i mean nothing sells like atlas shrugged Yes. that long after it was published. Whether that's a good movie or not is another issue. Right. But, I mean... I mean, yeah, I think it would have been a better TV series, but... Um, or whatever. You still have to have good people making it. And look, it is not like a dynamic piece of... I think The Fountain has a better story. Flows is a better story. Because it's like about... You know, a, a much more smaller fo- movies are, are very small. Yeah. Well, we don't need to get into a huge debate about whether Atlas Shrugged was a good should be a good movie or not. But I understand. I understand your point. All right. Okay. Um, did you ever see the Fountainhead movie with Gary Cooper? It was so funny. My wife and I watched it on like our second day just for laughs. Oh, really? And Patricia Neal going, I, I, I hate. I love this, so I would destroy it. Like it was. It was. It was horrible. Yeah, I don't think it was horrible, although. Yeah, it's not. It was not great, and Gary Cooper was not great. Yeah, um, look, the the, it, the book works as a book because it's you know it sort of creates its own little world. It, that's a hard world to transfer, I think, to a quote you know straightforward. It's it's a very um, it's a very um, grand story, you know, and it's got big you know, and the characters are big people, you know, they're all these oversized yeah. people. I know. I I love romantic literature like that oh it's that's what it is it, it's yeah. like a, it's like a, it's like a bodice ripper you know a good one yeah it's a very good i, I think it's a ripping book i think it's an excellent entertaining book independent of my politics i think it's a great little story um have you ever read uh cyrano de bergerac no, I've, I've seen the movie i've never read it okay uh the the one with uh jose farrer uh-huh. the 1950 one i have not oh you saw a different one there's uh I, I I saw it somewhere. Maybe I saw Roxanne or something. Oh uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm familiar with the story. I'll t- I can say that for certain. Yeah, uh, I just love that play um, because it's heroic and romantic and high and dramatic. And uh, do you ever see um, Shakespeare in Love? I think so, but I don't remember it at all. I think they made us watch it in school or something. I think you should watch it again as an adult because I think that that will fall into that category for you. Really. Okay. It's one of the more, and it's written by Tom Stoppard, who's a fucking, I don't know if you know Tom Stoppard. Mm-hmm. It's a great play, great, wrote, wrote, wrote The Crowds of Goodness and Her Dead. He's been a oh, great right. yeah. it's the 20th century. Um, it's a very rich script. Um, you may like, you may hate it. It's also sort of fun like a Shakespeare. Um, but but it's, a very, it's a very romantic, thoughtful, big, literate, romantic film. That's great. Something, uh, something you said that reminded me of something, but, um, well, I guess as long as we're on this, uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on moral systems in games, moral choice systems. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically dogma now that 
a moral system based on any kind of polarity is simplistic and should be abolished in favor of a system where choices are made on a case-by-case basis, no reference to abstract principles. I'm talking about, like, I don't, I don't know if you... Like The Witcher or Dragon Age compared to something like KOTOR or Mass Effect, where they have yep. these. Yeah. So, uh, now people say these case-by-case systems are more complex, but... I think they're much simpler. They're uninteresting gray mush. You can't design thousands of endings, each of which makes a statement for one of the thousands of possible configurations of choices glued together by some unknowable motivations in the player's mind. Uh, I mean, I like games that make strong thematic statements. Uh, causal moral statements. If you take this kind of action, these are the kinds of consequences you can expect. And I think the ability to make those kinds of statements is destroyed when you go into this. Well, we're just going to shear away everything but this very narrow choice, and we have no way of putting it back together or making any comment on it later. Um, I think Mass Effect Andromeda is moving towards that. Mass Effect is I love Mass Effect, but unfortunately, I think Bioware is one of the last bastions of this in RPGs. Anyway, they're moving away from it. Yeah. So, 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 in terms of you know moral choices in games and the lines of you what you said, the the best kind of moral choice for me is one that you know the writer can ask himself. Well, I wrote that. I'm not really sure what I would do in that situation, right? The writer shouldn't be able to look at it and identify what he would do. Because that's much more interesting, right? Because that at least has a shot of being interesting for people because at least they won't have an immediate response to it. Mm. And I've just started thinking about these things because I think you could probably tell from Bioshock that to some degree the whole notion of agency and choice of this kind was something I was, you know, had very mixed feelings about. Mm-hmm. Um and so I sort of, you know, took the coward's way out, right? And I said, well, let's make it sort of, you know, let's comment on, on the sort of the limits of the, this in our mm-hmm. media. Where now I'm actually trying to think about it a lot more. And that's, I guess, what I've come to is that I want a character, if I'm writing it, mm-hmm. a character with a set of decisions that I can't, that I haven't prescribed at all in my head, that I honestly can say to myself, I really have no idea what I would do with this. I really, ha- I really don't know. Um, and I think if you can do that, you have a shot of making it interesting more than what system you use. But you know, if you could sort of actually make it really, really, to, if you make it, if you just make it unclear, mm-hmm. muddy the water. Because a moral choice, if you know the answer, is not. You know, do you want to save the baby and get a million dollars or pay a million dollars and kill the baby? You know, that's not an interesting choice, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, there has to be uh, there has to be sort of things weighing on each side because in reality, we make choices all the time, moral choices, just most of them aren't very challenging. You know, like, oh, yeah, you know, a guy comes along and he's hungry, I'll feed him. But if, you know, the wolves were out and it was post-apocalyptic and I didn't have any food for my family, would I make the same choice? Well, that's a, you know that's actually a moral choice. Now I'm sure you've seen that exact choice in a million games, <laughs> but but at least gives you the baseline of how to think about the problem. Yeah, um, you know, you can get much more complex from there. Like the thing we're working on now is, you know, how do you how do you build the case against the obvious choice? And that's where you start is really spending a lot of time thinking about how do you make a compelling case for what would for what would seem. At first, like the immoral, act, the amoral action, so much to the point where it actually doesn't. You can't really tell what the what, what the author had a sense of what was moral, amoral at any time. Mm. This in this decision. Um. I just, I, I mean, if art or a story or whatever uh, is irrelevant to life, I lose interest in it personally. I mean. I, for, I'm not interested when I play The Walking Dead and I get this, you know, what Ayn Rand called lifeboat, 
question. You know, you're trapped in a lifeboat. There's not enough food to survive. And yeah. what what do you do? Um, that's I mean, that's not how life works. So there is no more. That's an uninteresting question. Um, yeah, I don't. I think. Have you played the Mass Effect games? Um. I played some of them. I, I I tend not to like. Um, strangely, I don't I don't play a lot of narrative games. Oh really? I like systems based uh, games. Oh yeah, you're you're big into Civilization, right? Civilization, XCOM, um, playing Invisible Ink right now. Right, I, I saw you. Based games. Hmm. I like Inside. That was a great game, but it oh, wasn't like really? a very wasn't a very specific literal story though either. Yeah. Um, that was a, I don't know, I, it was very ugly, uh, nihilistic, and I think that's what you get when you get games. You're romantic. You're such a romantic. I love it. I mean, that's what happens when you get games funded by the government, which I believe that one was, so. How can you play Bioshock? How can you like, well, do you like Bioshock? Because that's pretty nihilistic in a lot of ways. I don't think I think it's not romantic. I guess it kind of is. Yeah, it kind of is. Um, I mean, it's... I don't know. I have to be honest. I'm not really sure where that game stands on free will, uh, because. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, that's another thing I wanted to ask you. I maybe I just don't remember this from earlier games, but since Bioshock, at least, that has been just the tritest kind of commentary to make on games, the illusory, or the illusion of free will. Um, am I just... Uh, not... I was talking about the illusion of free will in games, not the illusion of free will in real life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I can understand how maybe somebody make that interpretation, but again, that wasn't my intention. Yeah. I don't think it was. <laughs> um, well... There's something here about... Uh, uh, that passé subject of games as art, which, uh, I don't know, I think people can maybe infer your views from what you said here and elsewhere, so I don't know if yeah, that would be very... I think I've said it, I don't really care, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a subjective term, and what's the point of arguing over a subjective term everybody has a different definition of it so we didn't talk about it before yeah i'll i'll do my own episode where i lay out the the truth and the truth people won't have to be confused Dude, i'm gonna need to call you every day if you have all these answers i mean like look, i'm gonna be I'm, like i'm at the bank but i need to get to the market it's closing what should i do and you'll have the answer yeah well my answer is read ayn rand because she's a bigger genius than i am and i learned what i know from her so Defer to her glory. <laughs> um, I do have something here about uh, <laughs> how altruism ruins stealth. So that sounds interesting. I can give you my thoughts on that, and you can tell me if you think sure. I'm stupid or not. Right on. Um, well, so uh, I'm probably the biggest Metal Gear fan in the universe. There are very few things. I feel comfortable saying, all right, if I walked into any room on Earth, I'm a bigger fan of this. I know more about this than anyone, no matter who's in that room. Metal Gear is one of them. So, like if I was trying to get you to bed with the fact that I told you I shook Hideo Kojima's hand once, would that do it? Well, I mean, I, I just assumed you probably <laughs> would have, so, you know. I met him once. He was very nice. <laughs> um... Very polite, very like he gave me like his business card. I don't carry a business card. I felt fucking awful because he had this gorgeous oh. business card. Hmm, that's sad. Um, his is very nice. I kept his business card. It was so nice. Oh and wow. It's, it's... Hmm. Um. So I read this interview from one of the. I think it was a level designer, somebody involved in that at Kojima Productions before MGS Five came out. And uh, the designer said that they had a, you know, play it your way philosophy that uh, they were making games for the guy who comes home after work and he's tired. And they're making games for him too, not just, you know, the big stealth fans. 
So they want to make it so you can just blow people away if you don't want to sneak. Yeah. Um, so, and I know you're, you've you been involved in stealth games, so I thought this would be maybe up your alley. Uh, he said that <clears throat> the moral that the that the tension of not getting caught well this is my view the tension of not getting caught comes from in my view it shouldn't be a relief when you get spotted you shouldn't think oh well now i don't have to waste all that time yes. sneaking around and i can just blow my way past everyone yeah. um but this designer said that the tension comes from the player's moral desire to try to avoid killing people. Now that is just the perfect crystallization of the effect a philosophical idea can have on something even like a game. Instead of being motivated to sneak around in order to protect your own personal selfish desire to survive, you're supposed to be motivated by the duty to adhere to some onerous morality. Now, the danger of being spotted isn't to you, it's to the enemy. Now, the quality of pleasure you get in each of those contexts is completely different, if you can even call it pleasure in the second case. So, what do you think about all that? Well, I do get a moral thrill when I wrap somebody over the head with a blackjack and <sighs> knock them unconscious. That is, I always feel like a great guy when I do that. <laughs> when I break into their houses and like I mean it's kind of funny because the thief you really play and I think it was really hard for the development team when I was working with them on it because I came from sort of movies and you know and 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 anti-heroes and I was like yeah he's gonna be this guy and he's gonna like break into people's houses and like kill them and then, like <laughs> sell shit for money and they were okay with that for a while but then I remember we started talking about oh yeah and there's this mission I had this idea for this mission I think went in the game mm-hmm I, I went off to do System Shot 2 before the game finished, but um, where you basically are hired by the, a bunch of merchants hire you to kill a mob boss who's been putting, you know, they've been paying protection money to, mm-hmm. and you're basically an assassin on that mission. Right. And they're like, well, you can't be an assassin, you're the hero. I'm like, well, you've been fucking breaking people's houses and killing them through all the whole game, or not even knocking them cold and traumatizing them for life. I, I, I think we're already, you know, we, that Rubicon has been crossed. Um, <laughs> So I'm not sure I would agree that there's some moral, like, that if you want to do such a one-to-one thing, I don't really think there's a moral win in bopping somebody over the head. I think the moral win would be, like, coming up to them and reasoning with them <laughs> and, and well, bringing them to your way of thinking, and everybody, you know, sings together and goes off in the sunset with a shared vision of the future. Um, well, I just mean, it was... It, that's just very hard to simulate. Yeah, it was just that this whole, you know oh, you can just mow everybody down was justified by the fact that, well, you'll still try to sneak because you don't want to kill them. But I mean, leaving morality out of it, kind of, although you can't really. But having a selfish interest in sneaking because you will die if you don't, that, I mean, the experience of that is completely different and better, in my view. It's more fun. It's more tense. Look, I can tell you we're stealth came from for Thief for me, right? I had played a lot of games like um, um, submarine simulators back in the day, mm-hmm. and stealth fighter simulators, and those games were all about being something that you're in a stealthy vehicle that it's very strong when you're ste- stealth, and very, very weak when you're discovered. Mm. So there's always that panic in the ste- you know in stealth fighter games when the radar actually painted you, right? right. So it was like these, you know, these you said, and, and there's this whole tension of building up towards the attack and getting ready to strike at that right moment. That's a very and, and basically that that's those games were a predecessor for me to Thief. You know, that's that's where we I got we were writing up the I was writing up those design documents at the very beginning with Doug. That's where I was getting my, my input. It's from also from an old game called the original Castle Wolfenstein, not the shooter. Do you ever play the original Castle Wolfenstein, the Apple II? Um no. It was a stealth game, basically. Um, you would walk around, you were in this castle with all these Nazis, and it was an overhead view, like um, you know, a two D game and look like berserk or something. And you were very weak if they spotted you. So you were basically trying to avoid the Nazis, and you had very limited ammo and very limited resources. And if they spotted you, there was bad fucking news. Um, you really had to get out of there. You couldn't really like go toe to toe with like a bunch of Nazis. Right. Uh, so I, I think I can, my 
certainly what my part of it I brought to the game came, I can't speak for the other guys, but came from those places of that real tension that we could build, that dramatic tension we could build in hiding out in somebody's space. And, and there's, look, I won't, there's also certain a, um, look, we, people have a, uh, what do you call it? A voyeuristic thing, mm-hmm. right? Where you're, you get to see people who don't know you're there having conversations. That was a big deal in it too. Right. Um, I think yeah, it yeah, came yeah. for me from like sneaking down to steal cookies from the cookie jar when my parents were still awake. And that terror, you were going to get caught. Um, but I wanted those fucking cookies. But there's yeah. also there's also excitement to it. Yeah, yeah. But And don't you think that goes away when you, if you wanted to, you could just beat up your parents and go back to your room? Absolutely. You wouldn't be able to have that tension because, look, we say this all the time. Like when we talk about a system in the game that's, anything but shooting and it's not a strong enough system the question i always ask is why don't i just shoot the guy yeah. yeah and any system whether it's anything melee system stealth system hacking system yeah. why don't i just shoot the guy yeah. and if you can't answer that question we have to fix it it doesn't belong in the game as it is we have to modify it to make it a valid option to shooting the dude yeah you should play invisible ink by the way okay yeah i've heard uh if you like stealth games, I love stealth games. Favorite genre? It, it's a ra- it's a here it's a random it's like XCOM stealth, literally. Mm, oh, I love XCOM too. So. You're gonna love this game. It doesn't have the depth of the strategic layer. It has some, but it has randomly generated levels like XCOM, but all based upon stealth heuristics. They really thought it through. It's a great game. It's really like love. grid turn based. Grid turn based. That's uh, what. Well, do you know uh, Metal Gear Acid? Did you ever play those? The PSP yeah, games. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I love those games. Yeah, I love those. Um, You'll love this game, trust me. Okay, all right. I will definitely try that then. Um, Yeah, that's... uh, That point about... Yeah, there's so many games where you have all these options and they're just useless. Why do I have 500 different guns? Why do I even have a melee ability? Why do I have a sidearm? Um... It, look, uh, it, look, it's very, it's very easy to. There are things that just become standards. Like, you know, why, why do we have salt and pepper at our table, right? Mm. It just becomes a standard. And then sometimes, you know, things, things aren't necessary, but you just feel like they're part of the menu. You always have, that's why every single thing in a creative work, and this is hard to remember sometimes, has to fight for its right to be there. Everything. Um. Right. I love games that find ways to cut out whole. Like I love, like for instance, you play you play the original XCOM and the XCOM that they put out a few years ago. Um, I've messed around with the original one, but I haven't played it extensively. But yeah, I played the the newer one, and I love that. It's a great example of of somebody figuring out how what didn't really matter to XCOM, what really mm. mattered, and and. Um, the Firaxis team did an amazing job of figuring out, and I'm a hardcore old school XCOM fan, mm-hmm. figuring out what was really necessary to that design and what was just a product of its time. And they were, um, there used to be like action points, like, you know, f- you have like 40 action points for your character, and you could do all these different actions, and they collapsed it to that two mm. point system. Yeah. And that did all the work of the, of the other system in terms of the choice space mm-hmm. with none of these sort of oh, I've got 17 points left, but this thing requires 18 points. Um, and so, you should, so anyhow, if you ever get a chance to go back and buy the old one, you'll see, you'll be amazed how smart the choices they made were in Firaxis 1 to update such a classic and really capture the spirit of it while simplifying it. Yeah, that, it might be worth playing through it just for that. Um, I've, I've put my... I'm, <sighs> I'm a completionist. I can't play anything unless I play the whole series. So I was, I was not. You're really hard hard on yourself, dude. I mean, I was not going to play Skyrim until I loaded up DOSBox and went through Arena and Daggerfall and (laughs) and I I did it and it was hell. But I'm not going to jump into the middle of something. I have to get the whole thing. (laughs) Um, You you are you're a you're a. um... You're, you you have a very clear belief system, which you clearly have a lot of allegiance to, and you're you're committed to. And I think you know that's certainly an honorable thing. You you you're very hard on yourself. <laughs> well, I don't think that's mandatory in objectivism, but that's just you're very, you're, you're <laughs> tough on yourself. Yeah, uh, I am in some ways, but it's worth it. 
Yeah, this has been great. Yeah, you, you played you played all of Daggerfall. Yeah, all of it. I mean, I didn't do every side quest, but I beat the game. <laughs> oh, I just couldn't imagine going back to a game that old and it had I mean, certainly been superseded by the games that came after it, especially you know Skyrim and and, and Oblivion. I thought. Um, so I really tuned into it. Um, yeah, um, I mean, Arena was worse than that the first game, so yeah, I'd have a hard time going back to that shit. <laughs> yeah, um, not that yeah. it was shit. Not that it was shit. Just it's you know it's old. Time moves on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can't. In some ways, you can't go home. Um, yeah, it was great. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Charles. That was fun. All right. Goodbye, dude. If you have any questions about what you heard in today's episode or anything within reason, you can just send me an email at charles.a.2 at gmail.com. You can also visit my website at charles2.com. There you can find information on and links to all of my work, including ways to support it. The biggest way you can support it is by becoming a contributor on Patreon, and there are all kinds of rewards for doing so, including one-on-one tutoring at a certain level. You can check out what subjects I tutor on my website under the Courses tab. But if there's something else you'd like me to tutor you on, and I consider myself competent to do so, we can work something out. You can also leave reviews for this podcast on iTunes or wherever you happen to listen to it, and that's a big help. So if you can spare a couple minutes, please do that. Thanks for listening. Let's meet again in Episode 7.